Sonia. Sonia, I haven't seen you for a few weeks. How's it going at the Crossbow Mission? Uh, it's going pretty good. Um, so yeah, thanks Norm for inviting us and, and uh, thanks to KCR for organizing uh, these town hall meetings. Um, just before I begin, I, I wanna respectfully acknowledge that uh, my workplace is within the ancestral, traditional and unceded territory of the Silex Okanagan Nation. Um, so mid-March, we decided to protect uh, the residents of our emergency shelter uh, by closing our building to the public. And this meant asking our volunteers not to come in until further notice. So this included Norm, who would have come in to serve our Easter dinner. And uh, that, that was really hard. So uh, without the community volunteers, it was a huge struggle to make the food that we needed to serve meals both at our shelter and in the community. Uh, we were fortunate that while we were on lockdown, we had some wonderful residents volunteer to help prepare the food and help with the cleaning and the day-to-day -day stuff at our shelter. Uh, so we stayed in touch with our volunteers by email updates and personal calls and the group, so that would sort of include groups uh, that come with banks or corporations. Uh, they were working outside the shelter doing food drives and collecting food for hampers. Uh, some were making homemade masks for our guests and staff, which were really great. So during phase two, we brought back limited community volunteers to help in our kitchen with cleaning and in our thrift store. Um, in phase three, our shelter is still closed to the public, but we're serving our community that live outside three meals a day uh, from a newly created mobile outreach team. And, and uh, there are two teams around Kelowna, 13 hours a day. Uh, the Salvation Army has been incredible. Uh, they've provided their food truck and staff and together with, with their resource of the truck and ours of food, we've been managing to still feed people in the community. So one of the new post-COVID volunteer positions is helping our mobile outreach team to give out meals um, and other services to people who are living rough around Kelowna. Um, and uh, we've, we've posted some volunteer positions and are uh, looking for volunteers. Thanks. And thank you for all the work you do at the Gospel Mission. I, I, yes, I do miss serving. Yeah. Um, but as far as volunteer roles go, I, I, I think I miss my other one more. I'm also a volunteer baby hugger at the uh, NICU at the hospital. So uh, as soon as COVID happened, they stopped accepting volunteers at KGH, which means I can't hug any more babies for a while. <laughs> but I get my fix with my own grandchildren. Dorothy, Dorothy, tell us about KCR and all the wonderful work that they do. And tell us about yourself too. You know, we've, uh, you have a long history in Kelowna. We go way back. We do go way back. Thank you, Norm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been so great to be a part of these town halls. Although, as we said, I was usually the one behind the logo. <laughs> Being Dorothy, I thought it was always funny that you would say, like, the Wizard of Oz, I was behind the logo. Um, but um, I have the great privilege of also working on the traditional and unceded territory of the Silks people at KCR Community Resources. And um, I feel really passionate about the work that I do. Uh, KCR is an amazing organization, a multi-service agency, and I'm going to share a couple of stories about our volunteers, but um, because they just, they just, for me, they righted the storm of COVID <laughs> because they're such great touch points. They're such great stories that when you go, oh my God, everything is going topsy-turvy, but our volunteers didn't. They stuck, they stuck it out and they doubled down. So, um, for us, the crisis line, of course, is, is a program that KCR manages, and it's a key safety net that provides critical care for our community 24-7. During this pandemic, our crisis line responders re, um, provided service that with an increased need of over 40% of volume and calls, and 140 an increase of 140% in high-risk calls. So at a time where 
those volunteers, they're highly trained, they're very skilled, but they're also dealing with things. And during that time, they're managing to help our community in such a critical way when the need was so strong. And they're also able to help um, relieve some of the pressure for healthcare workers by supporting them on some of their high risk uh, calls during that time on the emergency lines. One of the, uh, the silver linings, the blessings that we're looking at in, a, in our community is our settlement and employee mentorship program saw an increase during this time. As we all know, navigating simple everyday tasks became daily challenges for many of us. When you factor in cultural differences and language barriers, being able to manage this much change was especially challenging. And not only did our existing mentors step up their game by switching to virtual check-ins and contacts, we actually had a large increase in the number of volunteers from the community that all of a sudden phoned and said, isn't there a need? Can't I, can't I help in some way? Um, and a, a quote from a wonderful participant in that program says, connecting to a new member of our community has been a point of joy through COVID-19. And I think that's the feeling that, that, as you mentioned, being in the NICU award, volunteers get a lot from what they give when they're giving their time, but they also give a lot to the community. So it, it, both relationships are really important. And when volunteers can't give, that, that presents a problem down the road for our communities as well. Um, another program that we have is the Family Friend Program. And vulnerable families, the impacts of the pandemic have been deeply felt. Um, our caring and committed family friend volunteers continue to stay connected. They're with their families, they're paired up with, they stay in touch at first by phone, text, social media, and then um, as phase two started in outdoor settings, trying to ensure social um, distancing and safety protocols always, of course. And again, these are volunteers that are all managing their own families, kids in back from school, <laughs> all of the jobs, working from home and everything. And yet their commitment to their volunteer jobs stayed strong during this time. Um, when food security was highlighted as such a critical concern, our neighbors Project Literacy reached out and said let's build some community care garden boxes at our buildings and within a very short time Ellen will will tell you how quick a turnaround time this was but 30 people were all of a sudden committed to coming out and building 14 garden boxes filling them with dirt and planting food that now 20 volunteers are continuing to maintain water every day People are coming every day to water the, the, these plants and then harvest them and provide them to as food for our participants, which makes a huge difference. It not only helped to build community for our, our, our neck of the woods and, and create a sense of space that we're very proud of, but it really gave back in a critical way to our community. And again, it was volunteers that made that happen, that project happen. So as you know, KCR is the volunteer center of the Central Okanagan and um, we received some calls during this time and as I said they were my touch point for to, during this time to just say my god if all of these people are just wanting to give then then everything is still going to be okay because volunteers are still around <laughs> um, so it was amazing to be able to try and connect people with organizations um, and trying to connect people uh, to be able to give back and one of the one of your participants or one of your volunteers actually Trevor was a woman who had just been laid off of her work and when I talked to her she said well I didn't have anything to do during the day so what do I need to do I need to go volunteer and that's the spirit of the volunteers in our community and and that just I think why we all are in our dream jobs right now <laughs> doing the work that we're doing um, I'd also really like to acknowledge that key volunteer role at any nonprofit organization is the volunteer board of directors. These are uh, individuals who commit a year long to be at the table for many years, mostly, <laughs> not just for one year, but you know, it is a year long, year round commitment for them to be there. Um, and this has been a very challenging time for, for boards as they, whether they're a well established governance board like KCR's board of directors, they're needing to still be able to be there and help um, steward and guide the organization as, as uh, EDs are all of a sudden dealing with pandemic issues. Um, and then for working boards, be, they need to be doing the crisis management. So those volunteers, while they've got their own thing happening in their own lives and with their own work, are still focusing on their commitment to the organizations. And I can attest to that because the requests we've had from boards to um, do some, we run a board boot camp that um, 
is a great opportunity for boards to connect as a team. And the requests we've had from boards to say, we want to right now make sure we're here, we're, that we're committed to being a, a, a strong board during pandemics like this. Um, and they're committing to their own capacity building during this time to make sure that they're the best stewards for, for organizations. Um, and then, as I said, you know, it's just the fact that during this time, I've seen nothing but what I like to call volunteers doubling down. They, they have stepped up to do more. They have uh, taken on new technology. They have learned to socially distance themselves when all they want to do is hug everybody. <laughs> they, they've, they've wanted to ensure that, that um, the need is met um, and that everybody is still safe. So I wanted to say a big thank you to all the volunteers. And Norm, that includes you. And I want to say a big, big thank you for the, the work that you've been doing and volunteering to come in and do the moderation for these um, town halls as well. So. It's a pleasure, Dorothy. It's a pleasure. I, I, I'm sad to see uh, these town halls end, you know, live. We can always re resurrect them. <laughs> <laughs> we can, when the need comes, we can always, you know, put okay. it out for organizations. And so I might come knocking on your door again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you to all of you for the, the introductions. Some of you talked about uh, how, uh, how COVID-19 has impacted your volunteer program. Others have not. So here's your chance. If you uh, didn't uh, get in uh, how COVID has impacted you, please uh, uh, step up to the mic and there's no, you know, put up your hand or anything. Just uh, if somebody's talking, wait your turn. So who wants to go ahead? Let's go ahead. Everybody's talked already about how COVID's impacted your volunteers? Okay. I'll go to my next question then. I'll, I'll, I'll jump. Ah, there we go. <laughs> I'll jump in. Uh, you know, it's it's been really interesting. So um, what we're starting to find now, is, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of do a forward vision um, because we're right in the middle of looking at how we actually help our employees start to get back to a normal. Uh, we're also looking at our annual day of service. So for the last 12 years, we have gone out into the community and done a day of service. Uh, we've actually extended it to a month of service. Um, always been very, very popular, but, you know, we put a poll out to our employees uh, this week and we are, we're about 70, 30, 30% are saying, you know what, I'm not really sure I want to go out into the community right now. And, and then we've got 70 or like, yeah, you know, with social distancing, with, with some really good parameters in place, I feel like I could. And that's here in the central Okanagan. And, and I can tell you that those numbers are shifted when we think about the Fraser Valley and we think about uh, Vancouver Island. So for us as an organization, you know, we want to meet people where they're at and we want to respect the, you know, the, the feelings that each one of us have because they are very different. Um, so I'm really starting to put on that hat that says, how do we do both? How do we make sure that we are, you know, helping our community, that we're being physically distanced, that we're really being mindful of, of uh, all of the parameters that need to be in place? But what are the virtual volunteers? So I'm excited to hear a little bit from our team members and anybody who's uh, watching today. What are some virtual volunteer opportunities that, you know, individuals who are still self-isolating uh, and may have young children at home, but what can we do? So I've got some ideas um, on what we'll be bringing forward to, to our team members across the central Okanagan. But, um, you know, those are the things that we need to start to think about. One, how can we still be effective in the community? How do we support our, our social sector? And how do we support our neighbors? Because a couple of the things that I'm also thinking about are, are individual um, and not necessarily tied into a large uh, nonprofit or charitable organization. So that it, it's meeting people where they're at right now and asking what do you need rather than us saying, here's what we think. I think oh, that's super. critical right now. So Susan, what are, what are you doing to make sure that your volunteers feel safe, feel comfortable in uh, relating with other people during this time? Yeah, I think it's gonna be a matter of making sure that there's lots of opportunity, um, making sure that we have, you know, potential of outside activities. I think that that's gonna be, um, you know, ones that people will pick up more often on. Um, you know, we're looking at, again, how do we be in, 
do something meaningful, but in a smaller space with only less people, move the people through. So have our volunteers on a rotation basis, rather than you're going to go out for a half a day, you're going to go and do two hours so that we can actually expand that program and make sure that as many people get to participate, but again, being, being physically distant, right? So I think that that's key. And I, I really do think, you know, we went from 100 individuals in our organization to over 600 to a, re a remote workforce in the span of three weeks. And so when you think about that number of individuals working from home, what can we, how do we engage them at home in a volunteer activity that they can still feel part of a collective and part of a collective good? So that's where, that's where we're starting to put on our, our thinking caps and, and get those types of activities um, available. Right. And what about the rest of the panels? What, uh, yeah, what are you doing to make sure that those people that are watching now that want to maybe put their hand up to volunteer will feel safe uh, volunteering to organizations? I can um, maybe jump in here. Um, we were a little different because we were an essential food service. So we actually didn't shut down, uh, but we had to really scramble quickly and put in safety protocols uh, discussions with interior health, you know, uh, different situations. And the biggest thing for us was working through with our volunteers to make certain that uh, they felt safe. Um, a lot of our, our volunteers were uh, more mature and, uh, you know, older in age. And so, um, so they actually did stay home and they still have done that. And we just wanted to let them know, listen, your place is still here when you get back. That's the first thing we did. Um, and then I think the second thing we did is, is we had to change everything. So we used to have maybe 20, 25 volunteers a day, and we had to bring it down to uh, 10 per day and spread it out in the building in different ways. Once the volunteers kind of hurt us with more of a strategy and, you know, we had to be cleaning certain things, wearing gloves, you know, whatever your policies are for your organization, um, our board looked through it, we approved it, and then it kind of reassured them that we had a plan. And so for any of the organizations or maybe other volunteers that are looking and saying, I wonder if I can enter in or not, uh, we're seeing some people now starting to engage and say, I wonder if we can do this. And other ones are already in the rhythm and like, they're like, okay, we feel safe, you know, those types of things. Um, like probably everybody else, we did see a lot of millennials actually uh, jump in, which was actually really cool to see and engage with them. And, uh, and so we just was very clear saying this is what we need. And we started to, um, we actually created different sessions. I think someone else said this earlier. Okay, we said, people could do sessions in the morning. Uh, some people could do sessions in the afternoon. And now we've actually created a late afternoon. Um, and one of the things we're actually doing is reaching out to businesses and we're actually saying to them, okay, or families, if you have your social circles or bubbles, we're actually saying we're going to create an experience for you where all the rest of our volunteers are actually already gone and you can actually come in and do pre-made boxes. Uh, so we're actually going to start implementing that um, like for at 2.30 because all of our clients are done at 2 o'clock. So these are just some of the creative things that we did and uh, it was a big scramble in the first two weeks. And um, I think our biggest challenge will be now is, is when our longtime volunteers are coming back and then the ones that have actually connected with us, we just want to make certain we're trying to integrate them both sides well. Um, and that's something that we're seeing as well. So. Yeah, you know, speaking of coming back, it, uh, with the uh, report that came out yesterday that shows less than 1% of uh, British Columbians uh, have uh, the antibodies for COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, there's no way that uh, we're going to reach herd immunity. Uh, so we'll have to rely on a vaccine, which is probably a year or so away. So we can talk about that later, is how are you going to continue for at least a year under this new normal? But anyway, coming back to how do we keep our volunteers safe? I think, Dorothy, you want to say something as well? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, Norm, for us, technology has really been a great, a great savior in that. Um, because for a lot of our volunteers, it's about being able to connect with people, to be able to reach out and say, how are you doing? You know, when, when they're dealing with all of the things in their lives, having somebody that cares enough to say, how are you doing? And that can be done by technology. That can be done through a phone call. Um, it's not ideal because we, we're human beings. We love to, to connect socially. But 
like technology has really helped us and they, it's really allowed us to stay connected and they've had fun with it you know they they've been able to help the like the, um kathy who runs our mentorship program for the the settlement workers for the settlement team um has been saying how wonderful the volunteers are in sharing and showing how that technology can work uh with our newcomers and just the ability to connect through Zoom. You know, we're all getting a little bit Zoom tired of it, but at the end of the day, it's still better than no contact at all. And, and it has been a real savior for us to be able to have those options available to our team. So people need to, um, I think, feel safe when they're volunteering their time. Um, as Trevor said, you know, People need to either be able to say, okay, I'm going to be home or I'm going to be able to be in a place that, that is ensuring uh, safety protocols are in place for the cleanliness and sanitizing and all of that, and that people are socially distancing a little bit. The, um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Anybody else on what you're doing to keep people safe so you can have an inviting place to come and volunteer? Sonia? Um, so we, we've done a couple of things. Um, our thrift store is actually kind of ideal because we sort in our basement. So it's very isolated. Um, so we've had fewer people come in. But uh, you, you were saying millennials are volunteering. Well, we've got a 15-year-old fellow named Nelson, and he comes in several times a week. Hard worker. Um, so we're we're seeing new volunteers um and then we have uh, our dental clinic uh which we put so much work to make that covid ready um but just we need a volunteer to come in and and clean and, and assist the dentist and people are stepping up to that as well uh we had a lady today uh, Bev, who is making surgical gowns because our dentist was unable to buy them anywhere. They're all out. And she's actually sewing us uh, between 10 and 20 of these gowns from her home. So uh, the program is is really going well. And we've actually started advertising again to, to get more volunteers. Anybody else? I just add, sorry, Norma, I just sure. remembered the other thing I wanted to just say was that there are virtual opportunities as well for organizations. And as, as some organizations that maybe aren't having as many events or because they can't, then they're saying, okay, how do we now focus as an organization? So there's a little bit more organizational capacity stuff going on in their organizations. And there are certainly virtual opportunities where, especially the creative sector, being able to help with some um, development of resources for organizations, uh, helping to create websites, creating social media platforms, those kinds of things. Doing translation, doing that virtually, people are able to do that from home, working from home. Um, and then reference materials and other things. So there's there are ways for people to still give in that way as well, virtually. Are any of you um, short volunteers? Are you right now advertising for particular positions that you want filled? Why don't you use this time to uh, do your elevator pitch? Uh, we're, we're looking for several volunteers, volunteers to help uh, with uh, cleaning dorm monitor, uh, in our men's shelter and kitchen work, which is a lot of fun. So um, one or two people, it's not, we're not having groups in, but Norm, you know how much fun that is. Uh, getting there, you know, maybe making some sandwiches, serving the food, uh, but it, it's, uh, we've got our, our volunteer positions on our website and uh, advertised as well. Trevor, are you looking for anybody? Yeah, we are actually. Uh, we have seen to assess since summer has hit, like in July, we've seen some volunteers either they're taking vacation or some people are going back to work too. Uh, so we have seen a, a bit of a drop, especially in our afternoon sessions. Um, our mornings are still somewhat strong. And so um, all we ask is they can email us, call in. Uh, we do a 20 minute orientation. We go with the concept for first serve, just try it for the first time, see what they think. And we do have four or five positions, like whether it's building hampers or our food recovery sorting, that type of thing. So we would gladly accept people. Um, and we're looking towards that. And we just, in the midst of this, we tried, uh, we're trying an online software for 
the volunteers to see if they can do their sessions. Um, so, um, so, you know, that works as well. So um, I'm not a technical guru, so <laughs> other people are, are guiding us through that. And uh, yeah, so we'd love to have people sign up if they're willing to do that. And it could be once a month, it could be once every six months, or it could be three days a week. We'll take you whenever you can give us the time. Thank you. Now, Petrina, you said you, um, <clears throat> you had a lot of volunteers that with COVID uh, didn't come back or you didn't need them. Is that changed now uh, in July? Um, so we closed for two months. So yeah. um, during that time, the staff uh, did a lot of online content. Mm -hmm. um, and we found that a lot of our volunteers and members um, and supporters would uh, watch and share that content. So while we're not able to count the numbers of people coming through the door in the gallery, which is very important for us um, to, to see that, we've got numbers from um, online content engagement. Um, also, not just our gallery, but all the galleries, um, museums and other cultural resources rely very much on, on sort of people coming through the door, which is something we've had to change our perception of um, and the other thing is that most nonprofit organizations have to keep their advertising budget necessarily low so we rely really heavily on online social content and sharing um, and so our volunteers have become great cheerleaders um, they share content they watch content they tell other people they want to make sure that we're still there when they're ready to come back um, and we really appreciate that so when will that be? When when do you see yourselves able to open up again? Oh, we have been open since the okay. uh, uh, middle of June. Right. Um, we've put all the procedures in place. We've encouraged our volunteers that, you know, it, it is a safe space to come into. We've got limited numbers, one-way traffic, sanitizing stations, all the usual things. Um, but we do understand um, that many of our volunteers are in vulnerable groups. They may be seniors. They may be caring for uh, people that are vulnerable. Um, and so... I kind of feel uncomfortable doing a big push for new volunteers to come in. Um, so I'm very happy for them to, as uh, Susan was saying, you know, meeting people where they are is really, really important. Um, and we're very flexible. You know, we're a small organization. We've only got two permanent staff. Um, so anything that needs doing, we, we can all kind of shift and change and work with, um, the skills that are brought to us. So if someone has a particular skill and they want to help out, we can, we can accommodate that. Sounds like an opportunity for a lot of virtual help as well, as you yeah. said, right? With the sharing and, and promotion. Definitely. Now, Susan, your, your volunteer base is your staff. Uh, do you ever get volunteers that aren't part of your staff? You know, we, we welcome members to, to come out and volunteer with us. Um, we've tried that and, you know, I mean, in all good candor, we haven't had a lot of, a lot of pickup. Um, we look at opportunities where we can bring family members and that's often successful. So as uh, Trevor will know, you know, Feed the Valley here in, in Central Okanagan is our signature cause, uh, you know, we're working with hunger. And, uh, you know, it's great when we can get our families out, get our children out and, and get them, you know, really interested in supporting our causes as well. So we do look for those opportunities. They're not always possible. You know, as a corporation, as a credit union going into a nonprofit and, and wanting to be that volunteer support, um, we also recognize that we're causing a burden by going in. So I think that that's something that we've really, um, we're very mindful about. You know, again, it's what is it that you have that we can fulfill? Um, you know, because it's it's very daunting. You know, well, I've got 15 people and I'd like them to come down on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Um, you know, what can we do for you? Okay, well, that may not be the best approach. So I really think it is all around partnership. It's around having the conversation as to, you know, what is it that's going on in your organization how can we bring our resources to help? So, and I think there, there has to be a, a level of understanding as to the cost involved of bringing a group of volunteers into an organization. Uh, and so again, 
at Valley First, we look at that. We try to, you know, make that donation back from a financial perspective if we're going in and, uh, you know, we're coming in to paint. Okay, well, we'll bring the paint. We'll bring all the supplies. Um, you know, that's our gift as, as well as the time. And, and I think that's good partnership in doing so. Now, you know, Petrina did talk about virtual volunteering and how mm -hmm. they can help that organization. Um, and Petrina happens to be in Lake Country. In September, I'm going to be uh, uh, hosting the Terry Fox run again in Lake Country, but we're not going to actually run, right? I mean, we're not going to get together and gather in groups of 50 or more. Uh, so I'm going to look for all the virtual runners I can find. So if you have any of your staff, Susan, that want to help uh, out by being virtual runners, uh, please contact me afterwards. I'm, uh, looking, I'm looking for as many virtual runners and walkers and cyclists as I can find. Well, let's look um, at the challenge. Yeah, there's, there's the challenge. Now, I'm sure you can do it because I just got a, a Q&A here from someone that uh, says, I'd like to thank Valley First employee Kevin W., who is doing virtual volunteering at Village at Mill Creek with our music and memory program. He's doing it from home and dropping off specialized music iPods for residents at this senior's residence. He's making a huge difference. Thank you, Susan, for bringing this up. So That's there you go. How's that for a vote of confidence? That's An opportunity good. for virtual support. Yeah, now, absolutely. I'm going to make a guess. Trevor, no need for virtual volunteers? Um, well, actually, uh, we can be creative. I'll never say no to anything, uh, especially volunteers. But if we could use maybe a couple if they really wanted to. They could reach out to us. It could be right now like we're phoning our clients and just reminding them of their appointments. There's, there's a couple of things that we could do. We haven't been doing it, but uh, my eyes are open to what people are, are just suggesting today. So, but maybe there's other organizations too that really need them. So I don't want to try to take too much of the, the spotlight, but probably could use a couple. There you go. Sonia, can you use any virtual volunteers? Um, well, most of our stuff is hands-on. Uh, I, I like the idea of spreading the word uh, you're talking about your run. We, it, we usually have our golf tournament in September. And uh, so this year we're, we've teamed up with uh, Team Challenge. Uh, we're doing it together and it is an online golf tournament. Everyone still gets to go out and golf, but it's just not all on the same day. So uh, someone that wants to help with promotion of that, sharing that, that's great. And, and then just the stuff people can do at home as individuals, like the, you know, the ladies that sew masks or ladies or men and uh, um, the food drive. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the food drives um, people, people making collections and, and bringing them in. It's all being really helpful and they've been able to do that without uh, or without being close together. So. Cool. Dorothy? Yeah, no, thank you. I just wanted to say what I think right now, the point we're at for, I think from my perspective, March and April were such a heavy time of so much change and it was just like keeping the balls in the air, right? Boom, 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 trying to just make everybody be safe, be everybody keep going. Now we're in kind of a sweet spot of being able to think and go have discussions. You know, that was why one of the, the reasons we wanted to have these nonprofits too was to open conversations so that if, if Valley First or other organizations in, in town that have corporate employee engagement programs, that we have conversations now so that we can plan better for the fall and, and really implement unique, wonderful programs. I love seeing right now the, the creative ideas that people are coming up with about whether it's how they do their grad or how they do this or that, or, you know, building a goalpost so that somebody can hug grandma on her 90th birthday, you know, that kind of creativity is what's going to get help us get through this. And that's the same for our volunteer programs, how we keep our volunteers engaged, how we keep our organizations moving forward is when we're going to be able to think creatively now and I think that's the sweet pot spot we have right now and only by having discussions with each other by being really honest and saying Susan it's overwhelming if you'd offer me 20 volunteers at one time but here's what we need that's when we solve the problems right and it, it's just knowing that everybody's open to that kind of discussion that's really valuable so 
What did you say before, though? Something about goalposts and hugging grandma? Oh. What, what's this? I don't know if you saw this. So uh, there is a, a woman in town, and she happens to be a friend of mine's mother. It was her 90th birthday, and she's a huge hugger. So her kids got together, and they built a goalpost, and they put plastic all around it, including sleeves for arms, because for her 90th birthday, all she wanted to do was hug people. But they couldn't. So they created this goalpost with a plastic sleeve where everybody could just hug and everybody went by and gave huge hugs. It's that kind of creativity that allows us to shine as human beings, that allows our spirit to bubble up again. Right? And I think those opportunities are there for our volunteer programs. Those opportunities are there for our nonprofit organizations. Well, isn't this a feel good panel? <laughs> I, I love it. That's great. <laughs> So uh, last, last question before I ask you for some uh, concluding comments is, what, uh, what's your legal obligation to your volunteers? Don't all start at once. <laughs> we, we do have a legal obligation, obviously, to ensure their safety as well as the safety of our participants when we, we have that. Um, I think that's the board of a, the job of the board of directors to ensure that there are policies in place for organizations for that type of thing, that they get uh, guidance from a legal expert in the community. There are many amazing lawyers in our community that volunteer their time to either sit on boards and be a part of those boards or to just offer uh, service. We've ha been running a legal 101 series this past year that's had phenomenal impact on our community and for the nonprofits. And it's volunteers, uh, volunteer lawyers coming in and sharing information about the law with it. So I think it's, if you have a question like that for your organization, reach out to a, a legal expert in your, in your community and ask them for that advice. But the most important thing is that you're aware of it and, and considering it and that you have policies and procedures in place for your organization. And the rest of you, <clears throat> any particular specific examples of what you're doing? Uh, what we did is we just, uh, I may have mentioned this before, but we just came up with a very clear and concise two-page policy uh, for our volunteers. What was expected, what we could actually um, say to him, okay, we can actually do this. And then there's also, there would be the risk of it as well, right? And I don't mean that in a bad way, the risk part of it, but we just said, listen, we are doing social distancing. Uh, there is 10 people in the room, you know, those types of things in big rooms, right? I, I'm not talking about small rooms. And we put tape on the floor, like we just show them this is what it was. And then we said to him, listen, there's no judgment there. If you feel, if you're, if you're not comfortable with it, it's okay. Uh, and we did have three or four and we released them and said, listen, when you're comfortable, come back. Uh, so I think it was also acknowledging, the other thing we found too is acknowledging maybe they, they were anxious when they came in and it wasn't just like, okay, just go do this or dismiss maybe what they were feeling. Um, so that was something else that we felt, it's not so much legal, <laughs> but we just felt that that was important. And um and our volunteers did come back to us and said, we just love the clear, concise, and the thoughtfulness. So, and my team put that in place. It wasn't necessarily me, but the team really rallied around that with a good uh, board of directors that looked at it from a legal perspective and those types of things. So. Anybody else doing something different that we could add to the knowledge base? Um, our, and, and again, I, I don't know that it would be legal, but we... Uh, our volunteers uh, are just like our staff. So uh, we have uh, protocols in place for our staff to keep them safe. And it's exactly the same for the volunteers. So, um, and we've put a lot of protocols. So. Susan? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'll just say from, um, from a perspective of the employee experience is where we would be coming from. And, uh, and again, every volunteer that goes out our door and comes into your door, we want to make sure that they have the best experience possible so that they'll come back and, uh, and they'll continue to support your organization. And I really think it is, you know, as Trevor, Trevor said, it's meeting the expectations and understanding what the expectations are, not only from our nonprofit partners, but as an organization and knowing that, the individuals who are going out to volunteer do feel that comfort level. So, um, as I say, I think having multiple opportunities, different opportunities that uh, really lend themselves to everybody's individuality is, 
is going to be what gets us to the next step and gets us through this next phase for sure. So we're, uh, we're just about ready to close. And since this is going to be the last uh, of this series for KCR and, uh, and Norm and team, uh, here's my question to all of you, including you, Ellen, and you can end the whole conversation by going last, is uh, it looks really like um, we're not going to have uh, uh, a new normal uh, for a year or so. The, uh, we're going to have to wait for a vaccine of some, of some kind or build immunity, but with just under 1% of our population uh, being impacted by COVID and who knows how long that immunity will last though that less than 1%, right? So when we get to that, when we get to the other side of the bridge a year from now, hopefully, and we have a vaccine and everyone's vaccinated and, or most of us anyway, that choose to be, because it'll be a choice. How do you see your organizations looking after that point? Do you see yourself going back to the way you were six months ago? Or do you see something different? Is your vision of your organization different, even though people are safe again? Um, you know, is that going to be going back? Or are you seeing something different? So why don't we go around the room again? Uh, Dorothy, we can start with you. And then we'll go to Petrina, and then Trevor, Susan, Sonia, and we'll finish with Ellen. And then we'll say goodbye. Dorothy. Thanks, Norm. I think I think the the my perspective is that great challenges provide us the opportunity to try something new and different, and, and it's sort of a we can try it because we have to, and if it works, yay, <laughs> we've solved a new problem, and that's what we keep. And if it doesn't work, then we learn the lessons from it and move on to the next thing. You know, we we host the volunteer fairs for the Okanagan um, Volunteer Opportunities Fair in September. Uh, in Kelowna on September 19th and in Lake Country Petrina as part of that on October 17th. We have to look and say we can't have this as an event. How do we shift this event? How do we make it work for this year? And maybe we find a new way to reinvent that program. Maybe we find a new way to do that. So we're looking at what at for the, for the Kelowna one this year saying we're going to go virtually with it. We're going to decide to say we can't hold it in person. So we're looking to say we will interview the participants in the volunteer fair. We're going to set up interviews where we, we talk with people like Sonia and say, what are your program needs? We have discussions with people like, like everybody on this panel to say, and then the community can is invited to watch those videos and be a part of it, right? So it allows us, it's kind of like, a, it allows us to try something new. And if it fails, okay, we tried it because we needed to. And awesome. we learned Thank lessons you. from it, so. Mm -hmm. No, I, I hear you, I hear you. Katrina. Yeah, I would say we'll be um, entering a period of m much richer um, experience. Um, we've learned during this time to perhaps slow down a little bit and just um, uh, take on board new ideas, um, think of new ways of doing things, um, understanding more how important like how much we missed our volunteers and how much they missed us and how much the community missed it during you know having a time where we were closed for a while um uh, i think all of those things will come into the mix and, and create a much richer experience for everyone yeah i think uh just want to echo what some of the other people have said already uh, that, that we're we're going to be impacted for, for a while. We're doing actually a drive-through right now, so our clients are not coming in. Uh, we don't see that that's changing anytime soon. We don't want to change something and have to go back because uh, people are, are at least adapt uh, as have adapted to the new norm. Um, and so with that, um, we're going to continue to do the drive through. We're actually changing some of our, the way we're do, our property is used, you know, that type of thing for a long-term plan. And then secondly, I think in reference to our volunteers, the, the key thing is, is the ongoing communication. They're actually asking us saying, so are you changing this or are you not? And we're actually giving them the honest answer that we have in that moment. And they seem to really be appreciate, appreciating it even though we don't have all the answers. And then the other thing we're doing is we're actually asking them for feedback um, and saying, well, what would you change or not change? And, um, and just, just being creative. And I think like any volunteer, <laughs> I think it's, it's really just letting them know, like be personal, be thoughtful, even though sometimes it's crazy busy and, uh, and let them know that what they're doing is making a difference. Uh, I mean, 
for some reason, that just seems like for many of them, it's just like giving them a thousand dollars and, uh, and they're always happy with that. So. Thank you. And, and Petrina, thank you as well. I wasn't off mute when I thanked you before <laughs> the lips were moving, but nothing was coming out. Susan, tell us a little bit. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, challenge brings innovation and uh, resiliency. And I think the greatest thing that we can continue to do is, you know, Zoom, uh, virtual meetings, these virtual get-togethers, virtual coffees. I think, you know, the more that we can continue to be face-to-face, -face, uh, we can't hug Dorothy all the time. But, uh, you know, as we expand those bubbles, we certainly can. And, and I think, you know, the human condition says that, you know, we're, we're wired to be together and we're wired to support one another. And, and we find the ways to do that. And uh, today's is a brilliant example of coming together to, to do that and, uh, and to be a collective. So um, there, the normal will never be as it was, um, but you know, there's good things ahead and, and there's good people who are, are making good things happen. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for your support of the nonprofits in our community, Susan. Thank you. Absolutely. Sonia. It is going to look very different, I'm sure. Like Trevor, we have a new executive director that started during COVID and she is keen, she is enthusiastic, she's smart. Uh, she's already made a point of getting to know every volunteer, every guest of our shelter, uh, every employee. And uh, she's really excited about it. I know she's got all sorts of plans. So um, it's going to be very hard to wait. Um, but I, I think our volunteer program, and we've, we've got about 170 volunteers, it's going to be bigger and better. Cool, thank you. Now, when you said keen, enthusiastic and something else, I was thinking of Randy and I'm going, okay, you know, Randy is on his way out. Do we know, by the way, what Randy's up to? Is that public yet as to where? Randy's, Randy's retired. So yeah. He, yeah, he's he's retired. And Randy has been amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. What he's done over the last 21 years um, is incredible. So yeah. Well, maybe we'll see him back as a volunteer for uh, Easter or Christmas or something, right? He promised. <laughs> <laughs> he's coming back. So yeah. yeah. Ellen, batting cleanup. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I thought there's some really wise words said by the panelists, and I'm not sure if I can add too much to it, you know, except to say that uh, uh, all of our organizations um, prepare strategic planning either annually or three years, and we're just uh, going to be starting our strategic planning in the fall, and it feels a bit like I'm looking into a crystal ball. It's never, you know, work is not going to look the same. I don't think it ever will look the same as what we saw pre-COVID. But the good news is, is so many positive things came out of this. We learned so much just by being forced into situations that I think in the end, it will look better. We need to take advantage of those things that we have learned um, and that have worked well. And then we need to take back some of that humanistic aspect. I think that we've really lost with not having the face-to-face -face, um, meetings with our clients. So it will look different. I'm excited um, by that. I'm excited by how much that I've learned. Um, and I think uh, we will persevere. There's no question about it. And, and it will be stronger at the end of it. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you again to KCR and all the staff and volunteers at KCR. And to all of you, thank you very much for coming on to this uh, very interesting panel. I learned a lot. Hopefully you learned something as well. And Hopefully our participants who watched or will be watching the recorded version will also gain from that. So again, to all of you uh, out there who have watched, if you have any particular questions, too late now, <laughs> except for contacting these wonderful people directly at their organizations, uh, or you can just go straight to KCR and they can feed you to uh, the, the right uh, channel. So uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, be safe. Take care. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Norm. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Norm. Thanks, everyone.